Our first reading tells us the place was called Meribah and Massa. In the English translations of those Hebrew words would be mumbling and grumbling, mumbling and grumbling. And Lent, I think, is a very good time for us to find our place of mumbling and grumbling. I know for me, it's usually when I'm driving behind someone driving slow in the left lane. <laughs> and I usually think, well, I won't tell you my first thought, but <laughs> my second thought is God is probably keeping me safe, maybe protecting me from an accident or getting a speeding ticket, so I'll be patient. It takes time to get there when you're driving, but mumbling and grumbling, we all have a place where we find ourselves doing that, and it's a good time during this season of Lent to look at it. The reason today we read this gospel on the third Sunday of Lent, it's for the benefit of our candidates and for full communion and our catechumens who will be baptized at Easter. And what we want them to finally say, to get to the point where they can say with the Samaritans, we believe too, but it is no longer because of your word we have seen for ourselves and believe that this is truly the savior of the world. In other words, they've come to us on our word. You reached out or someone reached out and invited them to consider Jesus, to consider the church. And our prayer for them is that now that they are completing their formation, they'll be able to make their baptismal promises from a heart and mind convinced that Jesus is Lord. But this gospel is also deeply important for our own reflection, those of us who are already baptized. It's really asking us, are we Christians because our parents had us baptized? Or do we own our faith? And if the answer is yes, what exactly does that look like? And this gospel story can give us some clues if we look a little closely at it. When you first hear the gospel, you want to ask yourself, what's wrong with this picture? Jesus, after all, is a well-known holy man, and there he is alone with a woman, something that did not happen in first century Middle Eastern cultures, and even today in, in many places still. And the woman, of course, has two strikes against her. She's a woman, and she's a Samaritan. She's a Samaritan she lived in that area between Jerusalem and Galilee, and the Samaritans had went there during the period of the Babylonian exile, and they intermarried, but they can still considered themselves real descendants of Abraham. And so there was lots and lots of hostility between Jews and Samaritans. In fact, Jews would not be permitted to cross through the Samaritan territory on their way to or from Jerusalem. And that's why we see the disciples are shocked when they see Jesus talking with her. But Jesus is doing something new in his ministry. He's reaching out to, to the outsider, and he's broadening the circle of inclusion in his kingdom. And the scene, of course, is a well. And in the Bible, wells are important places where special things tend to happen. It was where Moses met his wife, it was where Jacob met his wife, Rachel. So in a way, this is sort of a marriage place. And Jesus brings us to the fact that this woman who is drawing water at high noon, which is an odd time, the women would come early in the cool of the morning together in groups for protection to draw water. But here she is by herself at high noon. And so Jesus offers her water, running water or living water, not the stagnant water that she has been drinking. And proof that she's been drinking stagnant water is her lifestyle. She had five husbands. She obviously knew her life was a mess, and she knew Jesus knew it as well. Now, her reaction is, is interesting. It's a classic example of what we hear all the time. When you put your finger on the sore spot, people will start talking about something else. And the best way to distract attention from a discussion on morality is, of course, to get into an argument about religion. If you ask someone if their lifestyle 
is really leading them to happiness and fulfillment, and if God is in their life, well, they'll usually quickly start an argument with you about religion. They'll say things like, well, you know, when I was growing up, my mother was Catholic, my father was Jewish, so we never did the God thing. Or we used to go to Mass, but my father got mad at the priest and, and we stopped going. Or, well, you know, I just don't buy it. Catholics say one thing, Methodists say another, Baptists say another. Or the usual canard, religion is responsible for all the wars in the history of the world. And 2,000 years ago, we hear really the same tone of voice. The woman says, I was raised to think that this mountain here in Samaria was God's holy mountain, but you Jews think that the mountain in Jerusalem is the right one. And the implication, of course, is, you know, we both can't be right. Maybe nobody knows, maybe nothing is certain, and maybe the morality you're taught is equally uncertain. And of course, they're all excuses, and they're irrelevant. God and the church are not the same thing. God's claim on every human life and God's offer of a new life for all who will give up the stagnant water, who come to him for living water, is absolute. And it can't be avoided by questions which church people think which church people think they should go to, any more than Jesus' claim on the woman's moral conscience could be avoided by a debate, a debate that was already hundreds of years old. And Jesus tells her, you know, none of that will matter soon, because through him, all people, no matter what tribe or ethnic group, will be able to worship the Father in spirit and truth. Now, as we hear, all this is a bit much for the woman, and she probably got a little bit annoyed at Jesus' line when he said, salvation is from the Jews, much like someone getting ticked off if we say the Catholic Church is the one true church. But either way, she couldn't make sense of the idea that one day true worship would have nothing to do with territory and everything to do with spirituality and truth. So she tries a different track. Perhaps this would put Jesus off. So she says, one day the Messiah will come, so why don't we just wait? And we'll let him sort it all out for us. And of course, sort of like a soccer player kicking the goal towards his own net without real, right, realizing the goalkeeper isn't there, Jesus says, and that would be me. And then things begin to change for her. Here she was, a woman trapped in a life of immorality, living as a social outcast. There was no way backwards or forwards for her. All she could do was eke out a daily existence and make sure she went to the well at a time of day when there would be nobody there to sneer at her or to mock her. Now, once she decides to stop drinking the stagnant water of her life and take Jesus up on his offer of living water, everything changes. Then she, an outcast, offers to her townsfolk the message of the gospel. She becomes the first evangelist to the Samaritan people. She now owns her newfound faith and she exuberantly shares that with others. And so the question for us today are we drinking stagnant water? Is our life or lifestyle out of sync? Are we hiding behind excuses, old resentments? Are we going to that same well again and again and again? Or have we drunk from Jesus' living water? And does our lifestyle demonstrate that? And can you really say, whether to your parents, to your godparents, it's no longer, I no longer need to rely on your word but I have seen for myself that Jesus really is the savior of the world.